Happy Easter, everybody. A really, 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 really special day for all of us. And, and as we always remember, the important thing about Easter is not that we get to celebrate it once in a year. The important thing about Easter is we celebrate Easter every morning when we wake up. And we celebrate Easter every time we gather together. We celebrate Easter every time we break bread together. Or even though we might not be breaking bread, we might be breaking pizza crust or we might be breaking steaks or it might be whatever. Every time we gather together in the name of the Lord, we're celebrating the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead. About 22, 23 years ago, when my wife and I were here in Jakarta, I had an opportunity to speak for an interesting bunch of people on an Easter, uh, on an Easter weekend. Uh, we were actually weren't in a church. We were down in a big, 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 big house down in the Libakbulus area. It had a huge yard, and somebody had decided to throw a, a, a big Easter egg hunt for little kids. And it was a part of the church that we were a part of at that time. And so the first thing they'd done, they'd hidden Easter eggs all over. And all of these kids, which were like grades, or were about, about three years old up to about eight or nine years old, was really the oldest ones. And, uh, and they went around and they found all the Easter eggs and everything else like that. And then they did even something a little bit further. They brought out a whole bunch of, of rabbits, a whole bunch of bunnies, and they turned them loose. And then all the kids chased down all the bunnies, you know, something like that. I, I wasn't, they didn't, they didn't ask me about the theologies of that whole thing. I'm a little curious about the whole Easter bunny thing on Easter. I mean, how can one animal be the symbol of Easter and Playboy at the same time, you know? It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for me. But as they were chasing around, it was fun to watch because there was this one little, really cute little girl. She was about two, between two and three years old. And every time somebody would grab a, a, a bunny rabbit, she'd run over and yell at him, put him down, put him down. And then they'd let him go, you know, and... And so these kids were all wired up, and after they got them all wired up, they gathered all of them together, about a half a dozen kids or maybe a little bit more, and they said, now, Pastor Dage, teach them about Easter. Oh, yeah. I, I wasn't really sure what to say, so I, I, I knew I needed to grab their attention, so I started off by telling them this. I said, you know what? Do you know that your parents are all afraid? I said, your parents are all afraid. In fact, most grown-ups are afraid. Because you know what they're afraid of? They're afraid of dying. Now, some of you are looking at me like, you know, Pastor Dave, is that, is that appropriate with a small crowd of young kids? Actually, look, folks, it's psychologically important. Unless they're immediately impacted by the death of somebody, most of, most of the kids who are like three, four, five, six years old, death doesn't mean anything to them. It's not frightening to them in any way. When I was about four years old, I went, uh, my mom took me to a, a, a dentist for the first time. It was my first chance to have a dentist with a real dentist chair, you know, it goes up and down and you go back and forth like all that and everything. And, and I, I told my mom after it was over, I said, dad's on a trip right now, isn't he? She said, yeah, he's traveling now. And, and then I said to her, sometimes when people are on trips, do they die? And she said, yeah, sometimes that happens. And then I said, if, if dad were to die, could you marry a dentist? <laughs> you know, because I wanted to play in the chair, you know. And for a little kid, that doesn't mean anything. It was nothing malicious, though my mom did tell me she didn't tell dad about it. You know, that was, she thought that might not be the thing to do. But I explained to these kids that because of Easter, there's no reason for anybody to be afraid of death. And, and I think they got the message. On this Easter Sunday, I want to share a message with all of you. And it's not about eggs and bunny rabbits and dentists and dental chairs and anything else. It is about the resurrection. Now, one thing I've discovered and I've come to realize is that when I first began to, 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 to preach in IES about 15 years ago, I always gave you the whole text. And sometimes we had a lot of text and your, your worksheet was really long. And, and then I realized all of you, almost all of you have like an iPad or a, a phablet or a phone or something with all the scriptures on it. And, and so you can, I don't need to give you all of these, but I'm going to be preaching from 1 Corinthians 15. It's a great and marvelous passage of Scripture. So you might want to get it out on your, you know, on your reading device or something. And in case I get boring, you can pretend like you're reading the Scripture, but actually you're looking up and reading the news or sending messages to somebody or something like that. And we're going to be looking at this great passage of Scripture where Paul answers the question for people who don't believe in a resurrection. And he develops this marvelous theology. And most of everything we know about what happens after death and stuff like that, we know from this passage of Scripture. And so let's take a minute to pray, and then we're going to look at the message today. Let's pray together. 
Wonderful Father in heaven, we thank you for the great privilege that we have to gather in this place and to be your people. We thank you as we open the scriptures today on this Easter day that we not only rejoice in knowing that Jesus is raised from the dead, but we also rejoice in the presence of the Holy Spirit. We rejoice in the company of one another. We rejoice that we are your family because of what you did in raising Jesus from the dead. And I pray that all of the benefits and all of the blessings that come from belonging to you would be in our hearts and lives this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, there's three, basically three things I want to talk to you about the resurrection today. And these are all three important. The first one is simply this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, it really did happen. It really did happen. Now, you might be thinking, well, Pastor Dave, this is a group of people. They're here for Easter for the most part, so they're pretty satisfied with that. But you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised how many people I meet that when we talk about different things and then they may say something along the lines, well, you know, uh, Jesus' disciples probably made it up that Jesus was raised from the dead. Uh, Probably they got this idea like this and they got this idea like that. And people have a lot of really weird understandings about history and about sociology and and about what people believed 2,000 years ago. And they don't really understand that it's true. Even worse than that, even worse than that, there are Christians who intellectually in their head believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, but it doesn't have any impact in their life. They go through life as if Jesus had never been raised from the dead. I'm going to read to you this passage, and, it, and, and this is what a wonderful passage. Paul says, For I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's, that's a, another name, that's Peter, Peter right there, and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. When Paul writes this, he's talking about something that has happened in their immediate lifetimes. Paul wrote this right around 53 A.D., and the, the events that he's describing, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, happened about 33 A.D. And the idea that somehow people wouldn't have known what happened 20 years earlier is a ridiculous idea. Now, on Wednesday morning, I'm flying off to Kuala Lumpur, and I'm going to Kuala Lumpur because my high school, I graduated from the International School of Kuala Lumpur, and my high school is having its 50th reunion. 50 years that ISKL's been going, and it's been... Uh, 41 years since I graduated from high school. I'm gathering together with all my friends, and we all remember the things that happened. Now, some of them remember one version, and some of them remember another version, but we all remember. We all remember we graduated. We all remembered this. We all remembered that. I can remember the 70s. I can remember the 60s. You know what they say about the 60s? If you can remember it, you probably weren't there. That's what they say. For those of you old enough to get it, you know what I'm talking about. The rest of you just went right over your head. But the reality is, is people remember the things that happened 20 years earlier. Do you remember what happened in 1995? Do you remember that? Do you remember that that at that time that that, uh, Thailand invaded Indonesia? The tanks were running up the the street here, and the, the Thai battleships were out in the bay, and they were bombarding Indonesia. You remember that? Of course not. It never happened. 20 years ago, you know, it it never really happened. You remember something that happened that recently. Let me ask you a question. How many Malaysians are here? Raise your hand if you're Malaysians or you lived in Malaysia. Okay. Do you guys remember May 13, 1969? Most of you are too young to remember May 13, 1969. But all of you know what happened on May 13, 1969. Significant events don't disappear. They're in your memory. When Paul said he was raised from the dead and he appeared to this person and this person and this person and this person, Paul has to be telling the truth because those people were still alive. Those people were still there. When he wrote this, when, 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 when he made this statement in this letter, those people were people that had come and been there. People who don't believe it happened are ignorant of history. There is no serious historian in the world, not just Christian historian, there is no serious historian in the world who argues that the early Christians did not believe that Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead. 
Every time you pick up a book by somebody who says, oh, they didn't really believe that, the, the disciples just made it up. You know you're not, listen, you're not reading anything by anybody who has any intelligence, honestly, because no serious historian believes that. The fact that it happened is of overwhelming importance, and as I mentioned, it is overwhelmingly important to you and I who do believe it. It must be overwhelmingly important to us because it impacts our everyday life. We can't go through life with this parenthetical idea that God raised Jesus from the dead, and so that's over there, and we're just going to live our lives because it has to impact us on a daily basis. You need more evidence? You need more belief that the resurrection actually happened? I got a nice little video to show you. Let's go with that Tom Wright video. Dr. Wright is a noted scholar, he's a noted churchman, he's a profound thinker and a historian, and, uh, and he wrote this fabulous book about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you have questions about it, and you're not really a believer, look it up. Uh, there's some great uh, long sermons that he preaches or teaches also on YouTube about that. But the most important thing I want you to get is to understand, for those of you who have called yourself followers of Jesus Christ, he really was raised from the dead. It's not metaphorical, it's not allegorical, it's not sort of, oh well, but it changes absolutely everything. The second thing I want you to understand is the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead is the total foundation of our faith. It's the total foundation of everything we have and everything that we believe. Paul is continuing to talk about this and later on in chapter 15 and he says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. And if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. What happens? What does it mean if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead? What does it mean if there's no Easter? What does it mean if you live your life as if Jesus isn't raised from the dead? Paul says it means several things. Number one, it means the Bible's false. It means the Bible false. Now, Paul's argument is based on eyewitnesses, including himself, who have seen Jesus. And he says, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then we're all liars. Now, in our modern world that you and I live in, of course, the eyewitnesses are not alive until now, but the eyewitness accounts are put together in Scripture, and our eyewitness accounts comprise of our New Testament of people who have seen Jesus, and people who have spoken about Jesus, and people who have spoken about the implications of Jesus. And if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then the Bible's false. It's a lie. In fact, it's an enormous lie. It's a terrible lie. Now, one of the interesting things about the Bible is, other than a few of the new atheists, most people will tell you, oh, the Bible's a good book. The Bible's a, a wonderful book. It's a book of wise teaching. It's a book of nice poetry. It's a book of this and a book of that. But folks, if the Bible's a lie, it's not a good anything. If it's a lie and it's trying to deceive people that God has a plan and that plan came to fruition when Jesus died on the cross for our sins and then God raised him from the dead, that's what the Bible's all about. That's the story of the Bible. And if it's not true, then that story's a lie. And Bibles need to be thrown out. But the testimony of the ages is that the Bible is a good book. The Bible is true. The impact of the words of God on people's lives. God's word changes people's lives because the Bible is true. Not only that, Paul goes on to say, but if, the Bible, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then we are still in our sins. Sometimes we get so systematic in our theology that we miss the story. Paul says in Romans chapter 4, he was delivered over death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. When Jesus was raised from the dead, we had the opportunity to be justified with God. Being justified with God means it's just as if I had never sinned. All those things, all those mistakes, all those errors, all those rebellious attitudes of the heart are washed away. 
and God receives us because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Our sins have, in fact, been forgiven. And I, one of the things I love to hear is to hear people describing about what it means for them to have begun to follow Jesus Christ. Because you hear the same thing over and over and over. They say, when I finally made that decision to receive Jesus into my heart, I felt like such a burden was lifted off me. I felt so free. I felt so clean. I felt so fresh. And it's a marvelous experience because our sins are forgiven. Further, Paul says, if, there, if Jesus Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then we really do need to be afraid of death. Because those who have died are lost. All of those people who died believing are actually lost. And there is no hope. One of the things that I, I, I get to do, because I'm a pastor, is I get to be with people in the last days, and sometimes the last minutes of their life. And I, I've told you before, when, before I was a pastor, it was one of the things that scared me the most. And now that I've become a pastor, it's one of my favorite things. The only thing I like better than being with people when they're dying is being with people when they're getting married. And in some ways, it's almost the same thing. I don't mean that in a bad way. When you get married, you have two people become one. They give up their old way. They take a new way. When you go to be with the Lord, you give up all this stuff and you go to be with Him. It's the same kind of a thing. Folks, I can tell you, having been with people when they pass away, that those people whose faith and trust is in Jesus Christ... I'm not suggesting to you that they're volunteering to die. Most want to stay and be with their families, but they're not afraid. They're not afraid. They're not terrified. They're not, you know, they're not afraid of those things because they know that Jesus was raised from the dead. And like I told those kids 23-something years ago, because of that, there is no more fear of death because Jesus has been raised and we'll all be raised too because he's the first fruit of the resurrection. Paul says, if there is no resurrection, then we people who have our hope in Christ are the most pitiful people of all. But we're not the most pitiful people of all. When you meet people who know Jesus, when you meet people who follow Jesus all around the world, you meet people who are wonderful people. Oh, there's a few that are exceptions to the rule. Come on, they're just starting on their journey. They haven't gone very far yet. One of my favorite stories, years ago, I worked with a guy named Alf Costin, and, and Alf was a tremendous man who'd lived a full life and a really godly man. I worked with him for three months, and I learned more about pastoring from him in three months than I did in everything else I ever did. And he told me about a time he went to another country, and he didn't know anybody there, and he was supposed to meet some people from the Bible school at the train station, and the train station was just jam-packed with all kinds of people. He didn't know how to find them, but he was like me. He was a classic Pentecostal, so he finally got in the middle of every place, and he started saying, hallelujah, hallelujah, and pretty soon, the Christians found him. They knew who they were looking for, and he said they were the joyful people, and they had a wonderful time together, even though they never really met each other. Why? Because we're not pitiful people. We rejoice in the wonderful fact that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. It really did happen. And it is the foundation of everything that we believe. And now we need to integrate this whole wonderful truth and reality and make it real in our everyday lives. My brothers and my sisters, my hope is that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. That is my hope. That is my joy. That is what I believe. And it has enormous meaning in my life. My hope is this. Because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, my life has meaning. My life has purpose. I have never in my life wondered, what am I here for? I've never wondered about that because I know I'm here to fulfill God's plan. Thanks, thanks to the Lord. When I was about 11 years old, I felt like he was telling me I was going to spend my life telling people about him. And so I've never gone through all those existential kinds of things. I always knew what God wanted me to do. And I rejoice in that because it made my life joyful. Because I know that the things that I have given my life to have value. The things that we have offered ourselves up to are things that are lasting that we belong to a faith where somebody like Simon, Peter, and John could say, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And we can live our lives saying that my life has meaning and purpose. My hope is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's more than my hope. It's also an understanding that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, my loved ones are secure. 
my loved ones are secure. Those who went to be with the Lord in the Lord, my loved ones are secure. I can hardly wait to see my father-in-law in heaven. When I first met my father-in-law, he wasn't a follower of Jesus Christ. But over the years that I knew him, he began to embrace faith and he began to follow Jesus Christ. And when he went to be with the Lord, he went to be with the Lord and I'm going to go to where he is. Looking forward to seeing Marvin, Mike. I'm looking forward to seeing your dad. Yeah, what a joy to preach at his funeral last year and just have a chance to know that he's in eternity. I'm going to see my mom and dad. I'm going to see bunches of relatives on both sides of the family who laid down a faithful foundation. I'm going to go look for the Apostle Paul and I'm going to ask him, what were you thinking? When you wrote those things, why didn't you at least give us a date and what you were talking about? I rejoice because I know that my loved ones are secure. But you know what else? I am reminded by the fact today that you guys don't even remember the 60s. I'm older than most of you. It's not just that my loved ones who have gone on, I'm secure in knowing about them. But the reality is I will precede most of you. And I'm going to go to eternity and wait for you because I'm not worried because my hope is in him and my hope is in the resurrection because Jesus has been raised from the dead. Death has no fear to me because it will only be a momentary interruption. And when you get to heaven, I'll be there waiting at the door. And I'll ask you if you know how to sing the IES song. Yeah, because that's my hope. That God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and because he did, it impacts everything in my life. It's not only my hope, it's your hope right now. It's your hope right now. You also can build for eternity right now. Lift up your eyes. Plan for eternity. Live your life with eternal values. Don't live your life seduced by the things of the world that won't last for a moment. Invest in eternal things. Invest in your family. Those are eternal souls. Invest in the people you know and the people you work with. Bring them with you into the kingdom of God. Those things matter. Plan your life for eternity. Let your hope be in eternity because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he gave you hope. Not only that, your hope is this. If things are not going well, you can change things. If things are not going well, you can change things. Look at what's happening in your life. Some of you are overwhelmed with circumstances. Some of you caused those circumstances. Some of you are total victims, and most of you are somewhere in between on that scale. But you can change things because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. What's that marvelous line that that it says in Scripture? If the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, He will quicken your mortal bodies. In other words, the Holy Spirit that raised a dead body into a resurrection body can also change what's going on in your life no matter what's needed. Look around and find out what needs to happen in your life. If things are not going well, you can change things. With God's help and through God's power, you can change things. Say, Pastor Dave, what am I supposed to do? Well, let me ask you this. What is it that you want God to do in your life? If you've got a terrible marriage, then you need to seek God's face for your marriage. If your business is struggling, then you need to seek God's face for your business. If you're discouraged about the future of some of your family members, then you need to seek God's face for your family members. Let God change what's going on in your life. But when you do that, there's something else you need to do. You not only need to ask yourself, what do you want God to do? You need to ask yourself, what does God want you to do? Because too many times we come to him with our agenda and we need to learn to listen to his agenda. And it may be that we think he needs to do this to fix this and the one he wants to fix is us. And you need to listen to him. It is your hope in the resurrection. Your hope in the resurrection is this, that you do not have to be afraid of chance. You do not have to be afraid of failure. And you do not have to be afraid of injustice. We live in a world that seems to be totally capricious. I was, really, I was a little bit interested because, you know, the, the, the choices for you to vote on in the Mythbusters, one of them included the question, Pastor Dave, is there such a thing as good luck and bad luck? And, and I was kind of interested in doing that one, but you guys didn't vote for it, so that's your bad luck, and I'm not going to speak on that one, yeah? But it's kind of an interesting thing, because you go through life, and it seems like, man, on, on, over here something good happens, over there something bad happens, and it, and it just seems like, you know, no correlation. But your hope 
is that the reality is because the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because eternity is secure if you're in Him, it doesn't matter what happens to you. It doesn't matter what happens to you in this life. I have seen in the lives of so many different people when they thought something bad was happening, instead God took what seemed bad and turned it around for the ultimate good. Not because they were able to do it, but because He did it. You don't need to be afraid of failure. You don't need to be afraid of failure. Most of you have set yourself goals that if you don't achieve those goals, you're going to feel like a failure. Let me promise you, if you are faithful and place your trust in God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, at the end of this life, you will go to be with him in eternity. And no matter what you do in this life, if you're in heaven for all of eternity, you are an absolute success. Many, many times we see people who are noted to be great people. But then after they're gone, a few years later, everyone tears them down. And everybody says, well, maybe they weren't quite what everybody thought they were. But it doesn't matter the verdict of history in your lives. What matters is the verdict of eternity. And your hope is in Him. Injustice. Injustice. We all want to believe in justice, and yet we live in a world where wicked people get away with things. And innocent people get harmed. Innocent people are victimized. That's one of the best arguments I know that God created us with an innate sense of justice, and yet he, we live in a world where there is no justice. And the afterlife, the eternity that God provides for us, provides and supplies justice. The Bible says, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. And some of them will reap it in the afterlife. This is our, this is your hope. And finally, this is our hope. This is our hope, our hope together, that we have this hope in the resurrection that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Together, you and I, we're God's eternal people. In the Old Testament, he called his eternal people Abraham's children. In the New Testament, he calls us all the sons and daughters of the living God through Jesus Christ. We are his people. And we're brought together to live for him and follow him and, and make a difference in this world in him because he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. This is a great illustration. I wish I could take credit for this, but it wasn't actually my idea at all. We had, the, we had the choir up here, and they were all singing, and we had all these people playing all these strings and stuff. And I'm sitting over here, and from where I'm sitting over here, I can hear all the parts. So I can hear the sopranos singing, I can hear the tenors singing, I can hear the altos singing. I don't know if they had any basses, but uh, maybe one or two. But, but I could hear all those parts. I could hear the individual violins, I could hear the different strings, I could hear the different cellos and all the different parts of them. But when it got out there to you, all you heard was this great sound. Because each one doing their own part, each one playing their own role, the, the orchestra and, and the choir melds together and creates this great sound. What a picture that is of you and I in the body of Christ. God has a plan and purpose for you, and God has a plan and purpose for me, but God has a plan and purpose for our lives together that gives each of us meaning and each of us purpose together. 